So, after my recent video running GTA 5 on my retro Dell PC I keep around, a lot of people were curious about the graphics card inside, and were wondering how does a card with just 256MB of VRAM actually hold up in 2020? This right here is something that long term members of the channel will probably remember. The world's most powerful 256MB graphics card. Which actually sounds rather impressive and has quite a nice ring to it. In reality though it's the lowest end 8800 GT you could actually ever get a hold of, being based on the 65 nanometer Tesla architecture from way back around the 2006 to 2007 era, not that the architecture didn't continue forward with a few revisions, it's complete with 112 CUDA cores, 256 megabytes of GDDR3 VRAM, the part we're actually looking at today, as well as DirectX support all the way up to DirectX 10. So if you thought our VRAM was going to be a limiting factor, don't worry, we're already being limited by sheer API support. But hey, for a budget high-end card from around 14 years ago, this is going to be a bit of fun. The card doesn't really use much power, but at the time was considered to be a pretty damn impressive budget beast. Provided you didn't mind using lower resolutions, because it couldn't really handle high definition ones back then because even back in 2006 and 7, 256 megabytes was not a great deal of VRAM. Before we get right into the benchmarks though, let's talk a little bit about what brought this card about and why this video just sort of exists, or is in the process of existing as I write this, or whatever this part of the video is about. Anyway, enough about the existentialism of why this video exists. A while ago, namely two years ago, I covered the most powerful card with this minuscule amount of VRAM, which would later go on to spawn the series the most powerful card with X amount of VRAM, which I'm since continuing. And a lot of us were really surprised how well the card held up. The main area of interest for the card was though, how it was actually a really powerful card with such this tiny amount of VRAM. This also gave us a unique experience to see how some of the biggest games out there today handle such small amounts of VRAM, at least the biggest games out there that will run on a DX10 card. That was pretty fun to do and it was pretty fun to see a lot of games running on such a small amount of VRAM. From there though, the graphics card ended up in my ultimate XP PC, because really it makes for an awesome retro card, because most games and titles I need to run on this card don't really care for such small amounts of VRAM, because there's no real performance drop over a standard 8800 GT when you're running stuff from well over 20 years ago. At least, that is the case usually. For those of you who do want some real history, I'd recommend checking out the main video on the card, as I do tend to cover why it exists, and although the video is a bit rough around the edges compared to my modern uploads, it's still good if you want to understand where the card came from. All in all, if I was to summarise it as quick as possible, it'd go something a bit like this. ATI was making killer graphics cards during this era, and Nvidia was not doing all too great. They'd only just got competitive again with the 7000 series, and then out of nowhere, Nvidia drops the 8000 series. Launching with unified shaders, or as you may know them, CUDA cores, DX10 support, and was so powerful that people ended up clinging to them right up until recently. Yep, these cards were fantastic. It also puts into perspective why such a strange card like this exists. Market segmentation. Why bother developing new cards when you just cut down the VRAM and suddenly you've got something to sell at a lower price bracket? And that explains why such a great card exists with such a minuscule amount of VRAM. But that's enough history and rambling. If you want more of that, check out the original video. We came here to see just how well this holds up in 2020. We aren't going to be using my old Dell system in this video because we've already seen how well that holds up with games. We're going to be pairing it with a Ryzen CPU, just because it's hilarious that this Ryzen CPU has to deal with such a little amount of VRAM. It's the pinnacle experience I can think of, but without talking about this anymore, let's get right into some gaming benchmarks. GTA 5 is the big one that a lot of you will be here to see. And it seems to run perfectly fine two years later, and it ran pretty similarly to how it did already, albeit slightly smoother than we saw in my video the other day, as it is worth noting that VRAM does not indicate the power of the card, to all the comments I keep getting claiming that your GT210 has 2 gigs of VRAM, why can't it run GTA 5? VRAM does not make your card more powerful. And anyway, if I was to give this card a modern day equivalent, I'd say it probably performs around an Intel HD 520, at least if both of the cards can run the titles. 
Still, it's all down to the use case. The frame rate could suffer in dense areas and GPU utilization would drop with a maximum drop around 10 to 12% when you're in the city and that's a worst case scenario when lots going on. All in all though, it did seem to run pretty well, although the frame times could suffer when of course the utilization dropped. I would say that with such a small amount of VRAM, it was really impressive to see the game running this well in 720p with soft shadows enabled, and it does just go to show that no, I didn't make up the results from the Dell, this old graphics card can run this game. Just frame times are going to suffer because you will run out of VRAM and graphics utilization will drop. The latest version of BeamNG unfortunately won't launch by itself. Fortunately though, in the Steam options, you do have access to a legacy mode for older DirectX 9 and an even newer version for DirectX 10 cards, which is actually really nice to see the Steam betas function being used properly. I wish more games took advantage of this so we could maybe go back and look at some past titles and how they perform over time. All in all though, the game did not like running with such a low amount of VRAM, and I do have to say that the card suffered quite a lot. All of this was to do with a lack of VRAM, however it was very much situation and location dependent again. Of course, heavy maps are going to have a much higher toll on the card because they're very VRAM intensive, but I was very eager to target a 720p HD resolution and the game was definitely playable with these settings. It just preferred to be running with more basic maps because loading in a lot of those textures really could hurt the card. Utilization on the card, even in a best case scenario, peaked out around 96% and that was on maps with no textures, as there is a lot for the game to load in here, and well, we really are forcing quite a lot onto an older card. CSGO is frequently regarded as getting tougher and tougher to run, and no one else says this more than me. However, for once, things seem to have actually improved since the last time I tested things. I was testing across a few bot matches of competitive, some online death matches, some online casual stuff, the usual stuff I get up to on a benchmark. Really though, I did have that new texture streaming option enabled, and maybe I need to do some more testing, it did seem to help performance. But we saw some major frame drops still when there were smokes and particle effects present on screen, and it's no surprise that deathmatches and large casual games could see slightly worse drops in performance. But overall, the game did seem to run okay, but really, it's impressive enough to see the game running, just the frame drops were really dire in certain instances, and stopped the game being fully competitive. You'd think newer city builders like City Skylines would work okay, given that they're meant to be lightweight titles, but we had to push the game right back to the lowest settings just to see a playable frame rate. Unity games do tend to be pretty VRAM heavy. That's not a thing against Unity, it's just the nature of the games. And our VRAM was usually pegged full the entire time I was trying to play, which did not help the GPU side utilization. Given the nature of the game being a city builder though, there are a lot of things drawn on screen at all times because you're constantly zooming about the map trying to build new things. Meaning that in some situations where you've got a large city, the VRAM is used up so heavily, utilization drops so low that you're not going to have a great time. However, for smaller to medium sized cities, the game did seem to run okay, and I don't doubt with a bit more VRAM and a really more powerful 8800 GT, maybe like an Ultra, you could probably see the game running in a HD resolution but that's not the card we're using today. Modern indie titles, depending on their intensity, will run okay. This is a very recent indie release here, and unfortunately, due to the VRAM constraints at higher settings, we pretty much couldn't play the game at higher settings, so we did have to stick to low here. But the game ran fantastically. Just the frame times did seem a bit erratic when there was loading going on, and could cause some stuttering, hence the 1% lows. All in all, I'm amazed that a remotely modern title like this is running with such a small amount of VRAM, so great job to the developers here. It's just that you can't really push up the settings like you can with the same card with a higher pool of VRAM, because the game just becomes a stuttery mess whenever you want to actually do something. And can it run Crisis? Well, of course it can. It could when it came out. But just to show you guys, here we are destroying stuff and generally causing a lot of carnage and mayhem and whatever you want to call it in a benchmark, and it worked about as well as you'd expect, with the occasional frame drop due to VRAM. But that's not exactly a surprise, because the normal 8800 GTs can run this game with high settings, and this was something people criticised back in the day with this low VRAM version of the card. It ran alright, 
you just had to stick to lower settings than you'd usually like to because you don't have the VRAM for the high settings, despite the fact the card could probably handle it. Then finally, to round us off with, I did test Minecraft. The latest version of the game with Optifine running did seem to run absolutely fine with 8 chunks being loaded and fast settings being used, all while managing a 1050p resolution. Because on this channel, that seems to be the resolution we always target with these older cards. Shaders and texture packs were completely out of the question, as they would have a huge impact on our VRAM, as would fancy settings as well. It really did seem to take its toll on this card, and could cause the frame times to really suffer. But hey, usually this PC is sitting in an old Dell running titles from 20 years ago, it's not really running these types of games. So to see it running the world's most popular titles pretty well, with the latest versions, is actually pretty damn impressive. Now, I thought I'd consolidated a pretty comprehensive benchmark list, and I did try and run as many titles as possible. But the issues I was running into were mostly API related, much like when we first took a look at the card in 2018. Some games could make it through the menus, despite the fact they didn't specify a DirectX level they wanted, as the card lacks anything past DirectX 10. But then I managed to also get a few issues with a few modern indie titles and a few Java related applications like Minecraft, which could actually give me a VRAM based error, which is what prompted me to actually install Optifine in the first place, as that did actually fix things, probably to do with the advanced GL it uses and probably brings down RAM requirements ever so slightly. Still it shows now that not only APIs are becoming a major problem, but actual VRAM caps are stopping this card doing anything. Not that many people are using a 256 megabyte 8800 GT in 2020, but still, we got some impressive performance out of it, it's just general usability is getting a bit worse. Given our obvious API limit, I did end up running an older version of a 3D Mark benchmark with the CloudGate benchmark, and we did see an impressive score of around 7000, and I'll throw up some comparisons on screen that I'll probably make after I write this script and do all that jazz, so you can see just how a bottom of the barrel 256 megabyte card performs when given a synthetic test to do, which is kind of a best case scenario. All in all, the VRAM didn't seem to have a huge performance deficit, but some of the heavier segments of the benchmark could really tax the card, and definitely did cause some performance deficit compared to a standard 8800 GT, which isn't really a surprise as that's what we said the entire video. So there we have it, 256 megabytes of VRAM tested in 2020 with all the things I could think to actually get tested on the card. I've got to say, desktop usage, a lot of people seem to be quite worried about it. It seemed absolutely okay across the board, I had multiple programs open and only once did I run into an issue, and this was throughout an entire day of testing. And it was due to OBS not wanting to play nice with me alt tabbing in and out of a game while trying to make sure it was recording properly just so I could, you know, show you the gameplay. It used up all the VRAM due to a bug and actually caused the PC to blue screen and the graphics card to start artifacting for some reason while the blue screen was going on. Very strange. The card definitely isn't dying, as I ran it through a stress test after this to verify. But yes, all in all, very, very strange. Maybe it's to do with alt tabbing out of a source title. I know they aren't happy with it, especially it's Black Mesa, which didn't work on the card either way and would just lock up and crash in its own window. But I've seen that happen before with smaller VRAM cards. All in all, general usage day to day seemed absolutely fine. I was watching videos, I was talking to some people. It was even able to watch streams and things like that. And it goes to show that sometimes VRAM isn't a decider on just how good a card is. And it's something I'll be definitely looking at for a future video. Maybe get hold of a real 8800 GT. Maybe compare a few other cards just to say, you know, sometimes VRAM isn't as important as people like to point out. Like, yes, it is important, but is it always a crucial factor when you're buying a card? Anyway, that's a topic for another video. I hope you've enjoyed watching this one. Good night. So, there we go. A lot of people have been asking me to retest a lot of the older cards they saw on the channel, just because, you know, it has been quite some time since I took a look at these little cards. If you want to see more like that, do let me know, and always like and subscribe for more, or dislike if you don't.